Kicking it off at number 10, Miss Kelly is Vecna's slave. In season four, we saw the counselor, Miss Kelly, that talked to Max. How's your mom holding up? She's fine. It was confirmed that everyone the counselor talked to, Vecna took or tried to take. And Vecna only takes people who have a dark past. So what if the counselor is under Vecna's control? And every time someone goes to talk to the counselor, if she deems it is dark enough, she then tells Vecna so Vecna knows who to curse. Also, Miss Kelly is always seen wearing a clock necklace. A clock which, whenever someone is cursed by Vecna, is the first thing they see. Now at number nine, a mind flare. So in the end of season four, volume one, we find out that Vecna was the first one in the Upside Down. But Dustin had said in season one that the Upside Down had probably been around for millions of years. But they say that Vecna is the most powerful. Vecna taking teenagers just seems like he's collecting people for the Mind Flayer. And the Mind Flayer has and always will be the one in charge and the most powerful. I don't think when Eleven killed one that she created the Upside Down. I think she just banished him to the Upside Down where he saw the Mind Flayer. And Vecna, just like the Demodogs, are the Mind Flayer's foot soldiers. Taking number eight, Billy is coming back. So I know you probably think, oh no, he's not coming back. Like we saw him die at the end of season three by the Mind Flayer. Well, here's the theory that most Reddit posters believe. In season four, volume two trailer, we can see what looks like a Mind Flayer trapped in a cage and what we think is still in Russia. Well, what if when the Mind Flayer killed Billy, it absorbed his energy so that the shadow looking Mind Flayer in the cage then humanizes and turns into Billy? You can't stop this now. Or what if Billy shows up in the Upside Down to help them, because in season three we saw a duplicate of Billy in the Upside Down. I mean, they already killed him off with an emotional death scene, so maybe not, but I guess it's possible. We can also hear in season three what sounds like the same clock sound from season four when Billy is in the Upside Down. Steve is going to die. In season four, episode seven, Nancy, Steve, Robin, and Eddie ended up getting stuck in the upside down after going through Watergate. Steve went in first, then came back up, and then got pulled back in. That's when everyone jumped in to save him. While they were trying to save him, the bats, if you can even call them that, were biting Steve, and it looked like some pretty bad bites. Robin even seemed quite concerned about rabies. So maybe that's foreshadowing that Steve will get rabies, or it'll be an infection that spreads. And because it's from the upside down, they don't have a cure in the regular world and Steve will die. I mean, I really hope not because I think I speak for all Stranger Things fans when I say we love Steve and don't want him to die, but will he? Chrissy, wake up! I don't like this, Chrissy, wake up! Coming in at number six, Lab Kids. In season two, we were introduced to Eleven's sister, Eight. And then the two parted ways so that Eleven could go back to Hawkins and help her friends. Eight then went with her friends to escape from the police. Some think that Eight will come back to help in the fight against Vecna. Some also think that it won't happen because we had a little time with Eleven's sister and their story was quickly put to an end, so it was just the end of a storyline. Others believe that Three is gonna be a villain in season five. When Eleven was trying to get her powers back, she did so in Nina. And while she was in Nina, she had memories of her being in the rainbow room, constantly trying to get the number three with that game where you put the little coin down the like thing. You know what I'm talking about. Some think that Three will be evil and very powerful and play the villain in season five, that Eleven will have to fight. Halfway at number five, Will dies. In season four, episode four, titled Dear Billy, Max goes to Billy's grave to just say goodbye because she thinks Vecna is gonna take her. Max ends up flying in the air as Vecna is just about to take her life and keep her body in the upside down forever. Luckily, they figured out music can help Vecna stay out of your head. In a behind the scenes video of Sadie Sink's character, Max, practicing the floating scene, we can see her strapped up in a harness. A photo was then leaked of what looks like Noah Schnapp, who plays Will, strapped up in a harness. Some say they won't kill off Will because they already almost did in the first two seasons, but like the reaction Will's mom would have if Will actually did die would be insane. So is Will actually going to die or will it be someone else? Or hopefully no one. Now at number four, Eleven. In the end of season four, we saw Eleven get her powers back and she looks stronger than ever. 
Reddit users seem to think that Eleven will have all the other powers that other kids in the lab have. And in Volume 2 Season 4 trailer, we can see Vecna using his powers, so some think the Eleven and Vecna fight, she will absorb his powers and then become immensely powerful. Others seem to think that Vecna will absorb Eleven's powers and he will kill her. Here at number 3, Nancy. So in the last episode of Season 4, Volume 1, we saw Nancy come under Vecna's curse. So that puts everyone under a lot of pressure because they need to figure out what her favorite song is. Otherwise, Vecna will take her. In the Season 4, Volume 2 trailer, we can see Eddie in what looks like the Upside Down playing a guitar. So the theory is that they figure out her favorite song and Eddie plays her favorite song on his guitar. <laughs> Or the other theory is that they don't figure out what her favorite song is, and when Vecna takes her, she doesn't make it. Nancy. Hey. Hey! Stay with me, Nancy! Coming in at number two, Eleven's father is Dr. Brunner. So as we saw in earlier seasons, Eleven was kept in her own room away from others at times, and Brunner seemed to take a more special interest to Eleven. Now this could be because she's more powerful than the others, or it could be because Brunner is her real birth father. In season one, when we thought she died, Brenner picked her up and seemed to be genuinely concerned for her. Now maybe that's because he thought he lost one of his little science experiments, or maybe it's because it's his real daughter. Eleven. Eleven, can you hear me? Eleven. We also saw that photo of Dr. Brenner and her mother, Terry, walking together in season two. Maybe Terry got pregnant with his child and Brenner decided to do experiments on her because it was his child too, and that he and Terry were together so it was okay. But I don't know, regardless, Dr. Brenner is still crazy and shouldn't be using those kids for his research. And Eleven and the other kids have always called him Papa, but in the last episode of Volume 1, he calls her Daughter. I don't understand. I do. Papa. Daughter. The Taking spot number one, Eddie is 10. So probably the biggest theory of them all is that Eddie Munson is 10 from Hawkins Lab. The main reason people believe this is because in the first episode of season four, Eddie mentions that he once had buzzed hair. Uh, my hair was buzzed and I didn't have these sweet old tatties. Which of course is the standard hairstyle for Brunner's lab kids. Second, people are guessing that the watch he wears on his left wrist could be to cover up his possible 10 tattoo. <laughs> And in the later episodes in the season, while well, it does show the rest of the lab kids on the ground covered in blood with their eyes exploded, we never actually see Ten's eyes. So he may have actually survived in the room with Brenner. Another point in the theory says that Eddie wasn't particularly shocked when Steve told him about Eleven and her powers. He didn't even have a reaction at all. Others have also suggested that Ten bears an uncanny resemblance to Eddie. Coming at number 10 spot, we have Bikini Bottom is the result of nuclear testing. This one blew my mind. See what I did there? Now the main reasoning behind a nuclear bomb is because some say that Bikini Bottom is located beneath Bikini Atoll, which has been a well-known location for nuclear bomb testing. And we all know how nukes are so evil, right Mermaid Man? This would explain everyone's ability to communicate in a human fashion, their strange behavior, and a host of other wacky characteristics. This show has many depictions of nuclear mushroom clouds. I know we have all seen it. And apparently in one episode that features a town called Rock Bottom, it supposedly mimics a crater created on the ocean floor due to one of these nuclear bomb tests. That's not all. You remember that island they hopped on when they went above the water? That's supposedly Bikini Atoll. And the reason why it's empty is because the US government relocated the 146 residents of the island to conduct these nuclear tests. SpongeBob creators hid this from the public because why would anyone want their children watching a show about post-nuclear sea animals? Doesn't sound too pleasing. At a number nine spot, we have SpongeBob bootleg tape. This is one of those cases of watching a video that is cursed, kind of what you see in the movie The Ring, except this one is on the kids show SpongeBob. This image was taken from a split second frame in a corrupted bootleg of the SpongeBob episode so dumb. The story is about a tape that was found by a group of five teenagers who were rummaging through trash cans outside an abandoned mental hospital. Other than the image, the rest of the video is composed of incomprehensible jumbles of colors, static, or just black screens. The audio seems to be a heavily distorted version of the audio from the original episode with loud droning buzzes occasionally interrupting it. Of these five individuals, two have taken their life 
one has gone missing and one refuses to comment on the tape. At our number 8 spot, we have the main characters represent the 7 deadly sins. The 7 deadly sins of Christianity are said to be represented by each of Spongebob's main characters. According to some fans, Gary the Snail, a bottom feeder who never stops eating, represents the sin of gluttony. Spongebob's obsession with acquiring a driver's license or Pearl's obsession with boys could be referred to as lust. Mr. Krabs, who once has sold Spongebob's souls for 62 cents, is undoubtedly an example of greed. Patrick is the laziest person I know in the show and he turned the sin sloth into a way of life. Given how much Squidward despises Patrick and Spongebob, Wrath ought to be his middle name. Plankton shows envy the way he despises the success of Mr. Krabs and is always trying to steal the Krabby Patty formula. And of course, pride plays out in Sandy who thinks she's hot stuff being from Texas and all. If they truly do represent all seven deadly sins, I don't think this would be God's favorite TV show. At our number seven spot, we have Krusty Krabs' secret formula is Krabs. So this theory suggests that Mr. Krabs is a cannibal. Let's dig into the theory because it's kind of juicy. So if you really think about it, Mr. Krabs is the only crab in Bikini Bottom, but why? In a past episode, Mr. Krabs says this. Mm, so that's what I taste like. And if you take a good look at the Krusty Krab restaurant, doesn't it kind of look like a lobster trap? You know, crabs, lobsters, same thing kind of. So he makes a ton of money from selling crabs, so he definitely keeps it a secret so no one will truly know about the horrors of what he is doing. At a number six spot, we have Chum Bucket's Dark Secret. Since we just mentioned the Krusty Krab, I thought it was best to mention their not very good rival, the Chum Bucket. We all know that everyone in the Bikini Bottom completely hates the Chum Bucket. This is why every day Plankton gets up to steal the secret formula because it's just not working out for him. A theory proposed by Reddit user Spongebob Lover 04 states that the chum bucket runs off of cannibalism. First of all, chum is the bait they use to catch sharks, which is usually made up of ground up fish. This would mean that Plankton secretly hunts down fish to ground them up and mix it into his burgers. The fish that would be going to eat at the chum would be literally eating their own kind. So this definitely makes sense why they're feeling extremely sick after eating this. At the hump of our list, we have Plankton is damaging Spongebob's brain. As the show went on, it seemed that every episode had Spongebob doing something more absurd than the last. A Reddit theory proposed by That's a Yikes stated that Plankton's various incidents with Spongebob caused him to damage his brain. First things first, Plankton was quite literally inside of Spongebob's mind in the episode Plankton, allowing him the ability to mentally program Spongebob, as well as showing a competent ability to manipulate the functions of the brain. In the Spongebob Squarepants movie, Plankton is shown to have mastered mind control with his chum bucket helmets, most likely due to the success he had on Spongebob. Time and time again, Plankton has altered Spongebob's brain, so it's definitely malfunctioning. Come on, baby, what's the name? <laughs> Kind of dark stuff, Plankton. At our number four spot, we have It's a Metaphor for World War II Germany. According to fan theory by Drake Grayson, the show represents pre-World War II Germany. Squidward, a failing artist and a complete jerk, acts like Adolf and wants to evict all of his neighbors. In the case for Adolf, it was the Jews, so SpongeBob kind of represents them in the eyes of Squidward. Patrick is pretty much oblivious the whole show, so it's said that he represents the ignorance and the blindness of the German people when the genocide was happening right in front of their eyes. Sandy represents America, always karate chopping, her way out of conflict, just like how the US came in the war guns blazing. Finally, Mr. Krab represents the rest of Europe, treating Germany, aka the Bikini Bottom, along with Adolf or Squidward, poorly since Germany started the war in the first place. This one is nuts for me because I would have never thought you can put Adolf and Spongebob in the same sentence ever, but I guess you can. All the way at our number three spot, we have Spongebob represents global warming. One Redditor made the claim that Spongebob is a metaphor for global warming. He claimed that all characters have their part in explaining the theory of global warming and its detrimental effects in the sea. For example, Spongebob is quite literally a sponge and represents the waste and pollution that is made in the world. We all know that pollution causes greenhouse gases that warm the earth, eventually melting icebergs, floating earth, you know the vibes. So Spongebob is the pollution and he works for Mr. Krabs who resembles large corporations responsible for the waste in the first place. Mr. Krabs loves that Spongebob works for him because he takes little to no pay with maximum efficiency, showing that these corporations only care about the money and not the environment. Patrick represents Western civilization because he is unhealthy, unintelligent, and quite literally lives underneath a rock, and only instigates SpongeBob, which is the pollution, to wreak more havoc in the Bikini Bottom. At a number two spot, we have every character suffers from substance addiction. The show was first pitched as an adult cartoon, so before all the child-friendly goofy scenes, there were a few mature topics that were left out of the show. One writer claimed that every character on the show is addicted to some sort of narcotics. SpongeBob is supposedly on speed or meth 
methamphetamine due to intense feelings of happiness, increased energy, and his intermittent paranoia that comes every now and again. This fan claims that Mr. Krabs is the dealer and that's why Spongebob is okay with making little to no money. Mr. Krabs is said to be addicted to cocaine because of his love for money which satisfies his substance cravings. Squidward is said to be on opioids which explains his relaxed nature and his urge to be left alone. Then we have Patrick who is supposed to resemble the common marijuana user but in my opinion he seems drunk half the time so maybe he does a bit of both. This theory is kind of dark so I'm sorry to some of the kids who have to hear this one. Coming in at number one spot we have Spongebob is a nature documentary for humans. Okay so a YouTuber by the name of Alex Bale coined this theory in the first place so credits to him. He explains this in more depth but here's a little summary. He said that Spongebob is actually a nature documentary film by humans to investigate abnormally intelligent sea creatures that act like humans. In an old Spongebob DVD there's a bonus feature that shows human scientists studying and filming the creatures of Bikini Bottom because the fish were exactly Exactly acting like humans. There's even one episode where Spongebob is taking a driver's test and he even runs over the human camera guy who's narrating as well. Test for the year and if Spongebob does not pass this one it means another whole year of boarding school! Aww. What happened? We can clearly see his human legs so this kind of confirms his point. You also remember the human hand that would appear on screen especially in the opening song when he puts on Spongebob's pants? Yeah. Well, this is because Spongebob is the main character of the documentary, meaning he has to take care and protect him. Then there's another episode that shows a human family watching Spongebob and turning it off on the TV, further proving this theory. Starting our list right at number 10, we have It's All in Peter's Head. For more than two decades, the characters of Seth MacFarlane's Family Guy has put themselves through increasingly absurd situations. Whether it's epic chicken fights or the Peter Copter, the Griffins have gone through situations that would be completely absurd in real life. However, in the world of the show, they can get away with just everything and be fine in just the next episode. So why is that? I read a fan theory suggests the reason why they do this is because the world of Family Guy takes place inside of Peter Griffin's head. Let's begin with his kids. We all know the unattractive daughter Meg. Well, it's said that she's actually a beautiful and popular teenager with a slight drinking problem. Meanwhile, Chris is actually a mentally challenged brother. Well, in the show, it kind of depicts that already. Theory says that one day she got too drunk and decided to pick up Chris, but ended up in a fatal car accident killing them both. This would explain why Peter dislikes Meg so much especially because her issues caused the death of her brother. His wife Lois was broken down from the death of the children and decided to take her own life while having Stewie in the womb. Yes, this theory is really, really dark, so I'm sorry kids. With the loss of the entire family, Peter loses his mind and creates this whole fantasy world inside of his own head. As for Stewie, well, Peter never got to meet Stewie, which is why he's portrayed as a smart and cunning baby because this is a reflection of how Peter expected his son to be. Coming at number 9, we have an allusion to the Twin Towers. First of all, rest in peace to all of those affected. But did you know that Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane was due to catch a flight that was destined to hit the Twin Towers and his reason being was that he was hung over and overslept. Because I didn't know this and I swear a lot of celebrities claim they just missed this tragedy but this one is a little bit deeper than that. It was such an important event that fans thought it was the direct inspiration for the film's plot of Stewie having a near death experience. Do you remember the scene where Stewie would get crushed by a falling lifeguard seat? Well the scene is peppered with snippets of dialogue that may or may not reference the falling towers. Such as Stewie saying quote, well then, it seems like there's only one thing to do. I must ensure that I had never gotten a close call with that lifeguard tower in the first place. And he also was saying quote, yes I did it, I stopped the tower from falling. This line struck out to me a lot because the falling tower was mentioned throughout the entirety of the film. Stewie's main goal was to go back in time to stop this tragedy. This moment could be attributed to the way Seth feels about missing the flight that was due to crash into the Twin Towers. That mixed feeling of guilt and relief is one of those feelings that are very hard to deal with, which could have inspired this traumatic episode in the first place. At our number 8 spot, we have the CIA's responsible for all humanoid animals. Do you remember that large chicken that would almost come out of nowhere and just start a full on MMA fight with Peter? Well, his name is Ernie the Giant Chicken. 
Damn, I remember those fights and I swear they would last just the whole show and be super chaotic and whatever. Well, a theory proposed by Reddit user Dal Taylor states that the CIA and the Family Guy and even the American Dad series has the ability to put human brains into any other animal or human. Klaus from the sister show American Dad and Brian Griffin from Family Guy are both great examples of this because they are both intelligent humanoids that could potentially pose problems for the CIA. Such as Klaus potentially beating the USA in the Olympics for skiing and Brian being a hardcore liberal. Humanoids appear all over the universe. It could very well be a brain swapping program used to control the population. We know how sketchy the government is and even more so in these TV shows. At our number 7 spot we have the multiverse. Just came back from a Marvel movie and it seems like I can't escape the multiverse theory even in my own favorite show. Family Guy is just one of those shows where anything can happen at any time. This theory suggests that when the show first got cancelled in 2002, only 3 years after its debut, the old universe was completely destroyed which is why the show is much more different after its re-release. This means that everyone in the show before are gone and the characters we see now are the people in a new universe. At our number 6 spot we have Stewie manipulates time on a deeper level. We see Stewie zapping it in and out of different time periods using his time machine. Casual thing for a baby I might say. But have you noticed that Stewie always stays around the same age? It doesn't seem like he gets any bigger nor does he look any different throughout the whole 20 years of the show. The other family members seem to age but very very slowly. For example, Meg started at 16 and now she's around 18. Lois turns 43 in that episode where she had a midlife crisis and Brian started the series at 7 and just celebrated his 10th birthday this season. So back to Stewie. He makes himself young to avoid the responsibilities of being old. Do you remember that episode when Stewie went into the future only to see a depressing sad version of himself? That's the type of reality Stewie wants to avoid. On another note, he could be doing it for Brian as well. Seeing Brian die for the first time traumatized him and he openly admits that it's his best friend. So he could very well be doing it to prolong his time with Brian. Right in the hump of our list, we have Brian is the real writer of the show. In season 12 episode 9 named Peter Problems, we hear Brian saying quote, I have a job, I'm a writer, I'm working right now. See this? All of this? This is the raw material of a picture of life that I'm going to paint with words. This got fans thinking if Brian could be the writer of the show. We know that Seth MacFarlane writes a show in real life and he uses his own voice to play Brian Griffin. He doesn't change it or anything. This could explain why Brian is often seen as the voice of reason or is the one to dispute arguments and feuds between different characters. Most of the exclusive and deeper meaning Family Guy episodes are the ones with Stewie and Brian. And since Brian experienced these firsthand, it makes sense that these episodes are in more detail than any other. Number 4 we have Peter saved Lois's life. Reddit user Lemonade proposed a theory that Peter saved Lois from a life of depression and potentially worse. It's mentioned many times in the past that Lois was a drug addict in her days as a young adult. She has also shown bad tendencies such as being a kleptomaniac who is unable to resist the urge to steal. On top of that her father is rich but always seemed to be a little bit busy and would often neglect the young Lois. Being from a rich family meant that it was unlikely she faced the consequences for her actions. So picture this, a young rowdy girl with no discipline and an addiction to drugs. It almost seems like a recipe for disaster, all until Peter came along. Peter was mentally challenged at the time, so this gave a misdirected Lois an opportunity to take care of someone which also slowed down her life in a good way. All the way at our number 3 spot we have Family Guy's All A Cover Up. Originally everyone's lives in the show were amazing. Cleveland still had a wife, Joel had his son and a loving marriage where his wife didn't cheat on him. Quagmire did the single life and his family probably wasn't tragic at this point. Peter was dumb but still managed to care for his family. Well, except for Meg. However, as the show progressed, everyone's lives took a turn for the worse. Peter and Lois would get into more frequent arguments which led the two to be separated multiple times. Meanwhile, Cleveland lost his wife and his show so when he came back he gained a wife that still loves someone else. Quagmire started to hate on Brian aggressively and he would often confess his love for his best friend's wife, Lois. Bonnie and Joe had a baby but right after they would begin to hate one another. Even Brian died for a bit. At our number 2 spot we have Joe can actually walk. 
Joe is just known on the show as a character glued permanently to his wheelchair due to an accident in the past. Joe is often seen to act over the top emotionally, but is also used to insert awkward yet still funny humor often regarding his disability. However, many fans believe that all of it is just a cover up and he is actually able to walk. In many different episodes, Joe explains the origins of his disability, but each story is different from one another. In one backstory, Joe mentions that he got disabled due to fighting with the Grinch on a rooftop. In another backstory, he says that criminal Bobby Briggs is the one who shot him in the legs. Every story is different and it just seems that he can't even get his story straight, which could potentially mean he's lying. Taking our number one spot, we have Stewie, Meg and Chris are not Peter's kids. A fan theory suggests that Stewie, Meg and Chris could not be Peter's children at all. Well, first of all, do we really think any one of them looks like Peter or Lois? In season 15 episode 20 name of House Full of Peters, it shows Peter donating his sperm to a sperm bank. The kids that shared the same sperm all pretty much look the same as Peter. So how could Stewie, Meg and Chris not look like Peter at all? The theory states that back in the day Lois had many affairs and we could see that that isn't impossible especially with her fishy past of adult filming and substance abuse. Starting our list right at number 10 we have the God Particle. There was a major breakthrough in 2012 called the Higgs boson better known as the God Particle. This explained how everything in the universe has a mass. However, it seemed that Homer Simpson discovered it well before 2012. Guess you can call him a genius. Because in a 1998 episode in season 10, Homer turns his attention to becoming an inventor, taking inspiration from Thomas Edison's life story. Surprisingly, during his time in the lab, Homer accidentally predicts the mass of the Higgs boson or the God particle, as seen in the picture with his representation of donuts. So is the God particle a donut? Well, not exactly. According to scientists, if you work out the equation, you get the mass of a Higgs boson that's only slightly larger than the nano mass of the actual Higgs boson. Another scientist named Simon Singh claimed that the equation is a playful combination of various fundamental parameters like the Planck constant, the gravitational constant, and the speed of light. So I'll be the first to say it, Homer is not the scientist we want for specific reasons, but he's in fact the scientist that we need. Coming at number 9, we have the 2013 horse meat scandal. Season 5, episode 19, in the episode Sweet Seymour Skinner song that aired all the way back in 1994, Seymour gets fired due to pranks caused by Bart Simpson with Flanders of all people replacing the principal. In a quick visual, we see lunch lady Doris rummaging for horse parts in a barrel to add to the school lunch. Attention, horse meat is back on the menu boys. It's no surprise since we've seen Doris do much worse things like date Hans Molman or getting it on with groundskeeper Willie. Fast forward 19 years and the safety authority of Ireland discover horse DNA in over one third of beef burger samples from many supermarkets and ready meals all around the world. This would be known as a 2013 horse meat scandal. Guess horse racing is slowly changing into horse eating. At our number 8 spot, we have a baby cry translator. Season 3, episode 23. In the episode, Brother Can You Spare Me Two Dimes that aired all the way back in 1992. Homer's long lost brother, Herb, helps create a device that could translate baby cries into real words. This device would have the ability to translate infant's gibberish into full English sentences. Imagine if this could be done. Oh wait, it did. Fast forward 24 years in 2016, Taiwanese scientists developed an app that could distinguish different crying sounds of a baby and translate into more common speech. Researchers said that the app can immediately decode a baby's crying sound within 15 seconds. So if you ever want to have a full blown conversation with a baby, your time is now. Tragically, at our number 7 spot, we have the Seafood and Roy Tiger attack. Seferid Fishbasher and Roy Hearn, the famous Vegas performers who worked with Big Game Cats, were parodied by the show in 1993. The Simpsons predicted the horned tiger attack 10 years before it actually occurred. In the season 5 episode Springfield, Homer and Ned Flanders travel to Las Vegas where they meet Gunther and Ernst, which is basically a parody of Siegfried and Roy. Near the end of the episode, one of the duel's white tigers is shown attacking one of the performers. Then, 10 whole years later, in 2003, Horn actually suffered a career-ending injury after a tiger attacked him during a show. The prediction from afar seems remarkable, 
but the Simpsons production crew dismissed it by saying that it was bound to happen. Guess they spoke tragedy right into existence and they were so right about it. With our number 6 spot we have the Faulty Voting Machines. Season 20 episode 4 which aired in 2008, Simpsons showed Homer trying to vote for Barack Obama in the US general election, but a faulty machine changed his vote. It showed Homer's vote change from Obama to his political rival John McCain. Now four years later after the episode in 2012, Obama was up against Republican Mitt Romney. There was someone in Pennsylvania who filmed themselves voting, showing that the machine they were using was broken. Just like in the episode, the machine would switch the Obama picks with Mitt Romney picks. Right in the hump of our list, we have autocorrect. The Simpsons supposedly predicted the autocorrect feature in a 1994 episode. This feature wasn't invented until 2007. In this episode, Bully Dolph wrote the memo, Beat Up Martin, on his Apple Newton. Then the text autocorrects to Eat Up Martha. When Apple worked on the iPhone keyboard in 2007, rumors say that the engineers knew what they needed to get right, and that was the autocorrect feature. Could this be influenced from the show, or did The Simpsons predict yet another incredible technological feat? Coming in at number 4 we have a Nobel Prize. In season 22 episode 1 which aired in 2010, it showed Homer, Lisa, Milhouse, Martin and others putting a pool together to bet on who would win the Nobel Prize for Economics, Chemistry and other categories. We got to see the Nobel Prize for Economics get announced. And while Jagdish Bhagwati won the fictional award on the anime TV show, Milhouse actually casted his vote on Bang Holmstrom, previously shown on the paper. The thing is, he actually won the Nobel Prize 6 years later, after the episode aired. Which makes us rethink what's true at this point. Could Milhouse be the one behind Simpsons predictive powers? Who knows. All the way at our number 3 spot, we have Canada legalizing weed. In a 2005 episode called Midnight Rx, filmed during the show's 16th season, character Mr. Burns starts a chain reaction making prescription drugs affordable in Springfield, Illinois. Because of this, Homer and Grandpa Simpson started smuggling cheaper drugs from Manitoba, Canada and found out that they were praised as heroes. On one of their future runs, they were joined by Apu and Ned. While in Canada, Ned meets a Canadian version of himself, set with a curly afro, but instantly starts taking a disliking to him after the counterpart tries to sell him a referino, which was legal then. Remember, this was back in 2005 or marijuana legal. Remember this was back in 2005 when marijuana legalization wasn't even thought of. Then fast forward 13 years later, in 2008 the prediction came true. Canada made cannabis legal in all provinces and territories. Time to add one more correct prediction in our list. All the way at our number 2 spot we have FaceTime. Season 6 episode 19 which aired all the way back in 1995 since it seemed to have predicted commercial video calling. Remember this is 1995, these were pre internet days and in this episode they show Lisa time travel to a time when she's having a face to face online chat with her mom Marge, which was virtually impossible at the time. Oddly enough, 15 years later Apple re-announced their new and revolutionary FaceTime, but I don't really know what's so special about lagging out every single 2 minutes. But what about Skype? Well, first of all, Skype is almost dead, but Skype was released in 2003, which was still well before the making of this episode. Even though technology was leading to the discovery eventually, Simpsons always seemed to be ahead of the game. All the way at our number one spot, we have Donald Trump. 16 years before Donald Trump's win in the US elections, the Simpsons predicted the billionaire businessman would become the president. In season 11, in an episode called Bart to the Future, the show predicted a Trump presidency back in 2000. In the episode, Lisa is pictured sitting in the Oval Office surrounded by advisors, where Lisa said that, quote, we're inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. The show also mocked Trump in an episode last year after he announced he was running for president. The show even featured a scene where Trump was seen waving from an escalator, almost exactly mirroring a video of him taken in 2015. Is The Simpsons a product of predictive programming, or are these too far-fetched to believe? Starting off this countdown at number 10, The Inconveniencing. This was Gravity Falls' first attempt to become menacing and still be child friendly towards its audience. For me, I actually really like this episode. Dipper and Wendy established a bond, with Dipper creating a really nice character arc all while him, Mabel, and Wendy's friends accidentally getting some ghosts angry by gate crashing at their convenience store. This leads to really amazing scenes with spooky images and music, stakes of the story, and a surprise twist laugh at the end. The whole build up to when the ghost finally appears is really creepy, but it picks up a lot when you see Mabel being lifted up in the air and her eyes glow. 
glowing as she talks just like Kevin Michael Richardson. That's when everything got real. This is the first time we actually see anyone get possessed in the show ever. When watching that scene, it creeped me out, but it also really surprised me too, with where the show was going to go and all. Given that part where Mabel turns her head the other way, in much a parody to The Exorcist, it was really creepy, yet really cool. <laughs> Number 9, Northwest Mansion Mystery. Here, Dipper and the gang are invited to Northwest's party at their mansion, filled with a horrifying ghost-seeking revenge, creepy wooden lifeless people, and terrifying sights of all kinds. This is a very dark Gravity Falls episode. While Mabel, Candy, and Grenda try to gain the attention of one boy, Dipper and Pacifica investigate the haunted tremors that rock the manor. In diving in, they discover a horrible secret that leads Pacifica to take a drastic turn. The twist here is incredibly profound and socially relevant, and surprisingly, Dipper and Pacifica's tandem pay off the romantic hints. And the best thing about this is it's not even focused on the main character. The real arc is with Pacifica, who turns from being one of the most annoying characters on the show to the one of the best. Even with all its scary sights, it's still a really fun episode to watch. Number 8, Scaryoki. Despite decking them out in Mystery Shack swag, the arrival of two government agents investigating the strange happenings in Gravity Falls does more to establish the season's arc than catalyze the episode's action. And the same can be said of Dipper's belief that, quote, there's something huge going on right under our noses. By the end of Scaryoki, though, it's an arguable point, because its second half set at the Mystery Shack's grand reopening party, organized by Mabel is overstuffed with joys large and small. There's Wendy saying of a black light going on her teeth, it's like a crime scene in my mouth. There's a very stylish dress stand fighting off a zombie horde, yelling, the only wrinkly monster who harasses my family is me. And last but certainly not least, there's Mabel getting her reluctant brother and uncle to sing the perfect three-part harmony that is zombie soul weakness. The contrast of the tween girl pop hit and a bunch of exploding zombie skulls is just pure bliss. Number seven, not what he seems. Is this the part where one of us faints? As Mabel's closing question suggests, not what he seems sends grab Gravity Falls' longest-running mystery into overdrive, revealing both who wrote the journals and what Stan's doomsday device is for. Before the episode's big finale, though, it's a heartfelt family trust fall wrapped in a prison break adventure sprinkled with pop culture allusions, and series and jokes. Among the highlights are a terrific dunk on Ashton Kutcher and punked in Zeus's laugh line. It's the final countdown just like they always sung about. But first among equals is Mabel securing her and Dipper's release from government custody after Stan is arrested, by writing several times as overrated in the dirt on a Hummer's window, so enraging a beefy trucker, and several times fan, that he drives him off the road. Number 6, A Tale of Two Stands. By the end of this series' second season, the truly best episode really starts to pile up. Some are better than A Tale of Two Stands, but few are more wrenching. Just the pathos of the episode, seeing the long line of bad choices and worse luck that Stan and Ford both make from high school on that pushes them further and further apart from one another, and deeper and deeper into the most self-defeatingly toxic parts of himself, it's just absolutely gutting. That Stan was revealing the secrets of his past and the depth of Ford's paranormal experimentation to the twins while under investigation from the government agency that has been trying to trap Stan in the act of dimensional tampering the whole season gives the Pine Brothers' harrowing history, both a chance to breathe and some much needed moments of comic relief. But that relief isn't a cure. The brothers do not come out on the other end forgiving each other. Number 5, Society of the Blind Eye. In this season 2 episode, wanting to retrace the author of Journal 3, Dipper and Mabel, along with Wendy and Zeus, track down Old Man McGucket to investigate. However, their search takes a drastic turn when Lazy Susan is kidnapped after a gnome sighting by a group of people in red cloaks. It sets in motion one of the series' most secretly ambitious episodes, first morphing into a study of Old Man McGucket, and then to an unsettling lesson about the uses of memory. The B-plot in which Mabel frets over her failed summer romances. I just don't get it, Wendy. I hug a lot. I can burp the alphabet. I have scratch and sniff clothing. Why does everybody leave me? As it turns out, the Society of the Blind Eye has been erasing the townspeople's memories of supernatural occurrences, using a machine that McGucket once a scientist developed and used on himself. Watching the man's mind and life come undone as his reel of memories unpools on screen is one of the more unsettling sequences in the show, though it speaks to the importance of even our worst memories in creating our sense of self. Now that I've seen what happened, he assures Mabel, I can begin to put myself together again. A stark portrayal of cult society the blind eye is a leap forward in the series' main arc of Grunkle Stan's hidden plot. Number 4, Headhunters. The reopening of Gravity Falls Wax Museum, followed by the execution of Mabel's glittering sculpture of Stan Tees up the raft, of humorous pulp culture references that landed Headhunters on this list. The central mystery is pretty low stakes compared to later installments, but the episode sees Gravity Gravity Falls begin to stretch its comic legs. There's a brilliant sight laugh involving Dipper and Mabel's crayon and glitter fake IDs, for which they pose as Sir Dipping Sauce and Lady Mabelton, to get into a dive bar. Not to mention when entering the museum, Stan finds the blinds left open, and wax Abraham Lincoln in a puddle on the floor. Wax John Wilkes Booth, he says. I'm looking in your direction. Number 3, Into the Bunker. This is the second episode in season 2, and it was excellent. There are two scenes with a shapeshifter that really caught my eye as a really creepy moment. This first one was when he revealed himself shaped as a person. At first we think it might be the author of the book, but it is 
later revealed to be a phony. He turns his head around, the body screams, runs up the wall, and is so disturbing. The second one was after the shapeshifter had been thrown into the freezer machine. As it slowly starts freezing him, he threatens Dipper. He tells him once he meets the author and learns who it is, it'll be too much for him. One thing that really sells this is the performance. The voice actor of this role is Mark Hillman, and he was once the voice of the Joker in the Batman animated series. And when Zeus said, good luck sleeping tonight, that really sets it in for you as the watcher, hinting that you probably will have issues sleeping after watching that episode. Number two, Weird Mageddon Escape from Reality. Weird Mageddon was a great three-parter, and I definitely liked the first and the third the most. But in the second, I appreciated how we got to see Dipper and Mabel's friendship come back together. But in between is when Dipper realizes how evil Mabel Land really is. When Dipper believes he's having a moment with Wendy, he realizes it's a trick that Mabel Land is playing on him. And once he stated out loud that she isn't the real Wendy, it then becomes a bunch of bugs, taking a very creepy and weird turn. As well as the entire atmosphere going dark, Dipper looks at the tree behind him, and it gets so creepy and disturbing, and then everyone's saying, we are watching you, we are watching you. A lot of the imagery from Weimergen episodes are already creepy enough, with the atmosphere alone. Part 1 and Part 3 are gruesome as well, with the dreary backgrounds and the really creepy characters, which are Bill's friends. But in the episode, that scene stands out the most as very dark and disturbing when tapping into Bill's true power, and what he wants to do to reshape the world as his playpen as twisted and sick as he wants it to be. Now coming into number one, Summerween. Of course, because Gravity Falls has a spooky vibe, so they have to have a Halloween episode. Leading to an awesome story about Dipper, Mabel, and their friends trying to collect enough candy. The story focuses mainly on Dipper building an arc, but we also see Mabel's insecurities about growing up and understanding between them as the episode progresses. The scariest moment of the entire episode is when the Summerween trickster is on screen. He may not have powers, but his physicality makes him resemble a creature from Spirited Away named No Face. He is obsessed with getting the children to get him candy, and if they don't, he will eat them like no one ate him. Which is weird, but despite this odd motivation, though his backstory does come up very frightening into how he was designed and everything. 